Almighty God, we stand here in awe of you as we rejoice in your holiness and that you would be willing in your holiness to associate with such as us and that you would even take pleasure in our worship. We pray now that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word and that you would lead us into the paths of obedience to Jesus Christ, that you might be glorified in us and through us forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our scripture lesson this morning is from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This is God's word. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you for responding. That's just what I hoped you would do. I've been told that Presbyterians are the frozen chosen, but you proved me wrong. That... Well, it's common for us to wish people Happy New Year. I probably wish, it, uh, wish hundreds of people, including strangers, Happy New Year. And, it, and it's something that we want people to experience. Did you know there's actually a lot of different traditions in different cultures for how people, for things people do to try to assure that the new year that's beginning will be a happy new year. For instance, uh, the Greeks, what they do is they see the onion as a symbol of rebirth for the coming year. And so they will hang an onion from their front door on New Year's Eve. And then in the morning, they hit their kids on the head with that onion <laughs> in order to wake them up so that they will have good luck and prosperity in the year ahead. The Bolivians, <laughs> oh, those Bolivians, they increase their fortune and health for the coming year by wearing bright yellow underwear on New Year's Day. Of course, in America, we kiss, we kiss strangers on Times Square, so who knows? I mean, I really do want you to have a happy new year. But I also realize, and I think most of us are old enough to know it, that happiness is fleeting. And we all know that happiness can be stolen away by bad things that happen to us. And it can also be stolen away by good things that we're counting on that don't happen to us. And yet, according to God's word, joy is one of the chief characteristics of an authentic Christian life. To 
Did you notice when I was reading the scripture, and you probably noticed it was from a different translation than what's, than what's in your bulletins, but I'm going to that translation in just a minute, so don't worry. The one word I emphasized was rejoice. Because there's a, happy, a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is superficial. Joy, on the other hand, runs soul deep. Happiness is dependent on our circumstances. Joy transcends circumstances. Happiness comes and goes. Joy is actually a state of being. To understand this, I need to give you a little lesson in theology. Aren't you happy to start the year with a theology lesson? Well, I'm going to dress it up in easy-to-understand language because good theology is at the heart of our joy. So here's how Paul describes our theological position in the passage we just read. Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are following along in your bulletin, you can circle the word justified on the scripture lesson there. I have joy because I am justified by faith. Now, justification is one of those great Christian words, you know. We all use it a lot. It's a good, it's a good theological concept. And, uh, and yet I would guess that most Christians, if we were really pushed, would not be able to under, explain exactly what justification means. So I'm going to tell you right now, okay? Justification, according to Scripture, is imputed righteousness. That helps a lot, doesn't it? Well, it does if we understand what imputed means. Imputation is a bookkeeping term. It's what Paul described about in, back in chapter 4 when he was talking about Abraham. Paul said, what, what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him or imputed to him as righteousness. So let me make this more practical. I want you to imagine that you are walking into one of those old offices that accountants used to use. And the sun is filtering in through the windows. You can see the dust in the air. You can smell the smell of, of leather and paper because the, the, the walls are lined with volume after volume after volume of leather-bound books. And as we walk in, the bookkeeper reaches up and he pulls down a large volume and on the faded cover in gold leaf is my name, or in your case, your name. In my case, Jeffrey Hayes Wildrick. And he opens the volume and there, spelled out in the minutest detail, column after column is a complete record of my sin. And it's a horrifying list. Every deception, every degrading thought, every failed opportunity to do good, every secret sin, there in bold black ink, column after column after column, a record of my shame. And I have to admit to you right now that there are many things in my life that I would like to have redacted before anybody else ever got a chance to see them. And I imagine there are a few pages in the book of your life that you would rather not have turned as well, but there it is. And at the bottom of the last page, written in bold block letters is this inscription, the full sum of Jeffrey Hayes Wildrick's sin, transgression, iniquity, and guile. Now the bookkeeper reaches for another book, and this book has a cross on the cover. And below the name of the cross, below the cross is the name Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God. And he opens 
the book and he takes a pen and he carefully writes on, on a blank page, transferred from the account of Jeffrey Hayes Wildrick, the sum total of his sin, transgression, iniquity, and guile. And being a good bookkeeper, he then returns to my book and with a bold stroke crosses out the earlier entry of my shame and he writes, transferred to the account of Jesus Christ. Naz, Jesus, the Son of God. Imagine this. All of your shame and all of your sin swooping backward in time and landing upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ as he hangs from the cross and it is crucified there with him. Do you know what that is? It's pretty good, isn't it? But that is only half of what Scripture means by imputed righteousness. Now the bookkeeper goes back to the book with Jesus' name on it, and he turns to the next page, and what we read on that page is nothing short of glorious. Written in gold ink and column after column, row after row, is spilled out, spelled out the, the full righteousness of Jesus Christ, his sinless life, his unconditional love, his unlimited patience, his godliness and grace, his holiness that we just sang about. And the bookkeeper takes his pen again, and he writes across the bottom of that page, transferred to the account of Jeffrey Hayes Wildrick. And then when we turn back to the page in my book, we discover written there in the same gold ink these words, transferred from the account of Jesus of Nazareth, the sum total of the righteousness of the Son of God. And the same thing is true for every person who turns in faith to Jesus Christ because his capacity to bear our sin is unending and the quantity of his righteousness to share is infinite. That is imputed righteousness. That is what it means to be justified by faith. And when you understand that little bit of theology dressed up in understandable language, you cannot help but rejoice. And by the way, when you look at one of your brothers and, or sisters in faith and you can't see past their faults and their sins, Please remember that when God sees them, he sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. And that's the way we need to learn to see them, too. Now, as if that's not enough, Paul reminds us we have something else to rejoice about. Verse 2, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And you can circle the word Hope. As Christians, we have the hope of sharing God's glory. Now, you probably already know this, but there are more than one way to use the word hope. And we need to understand what kind of hope Paul is talking about here. Let's say that I went over to one of the dorms at Missouri State, just you know, across the way here, and I walked down the hallway, and as I was walking down the hallway, I I ran into a a, a young man, and uh, to tell you the truth, this this fellow doesn't doesn't look too good. His his eyes are kind of glassy, and and it looks like he's focusing on something just behind me, and he might have called it a good night, but I would say it looks like he's had a rough night, okay? And I asked him, well, what are your plans for the future? And he goes, well, uh, I've, I've turned in most of my homework assignments on time. And um, I've, even, though I've, uh, even though I've cut a few classes, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling an almost a D average. 
I hope I'm going to graduate in the spring. <laughs> and, and as he follows some invisible fly with his eyes, I pat him on the back and say, good luck, you know. Now, after he walks away, a rather erudite-looking young lady comes along behind him, and I ask her the same question, what are your plans for the future? And she answers, well, I've been working really hard. I'm getting A's in all of my classes, and I've just finished up some extra credit work on genetics in my, in my biology class. I, I hope to graduate in the spring and go on to a career in bioscience. D do you notice the difference? They both use the word hope, but with very different meanings. The first fellow, I hope so, is, is really using the word hope as a synonym for wish because it's really just wishful thinking. But the young lady is expressing a hope in which there is overwhelming confidence. Christian hope is a hope of overwhelming confidence. Confidence in a God who is committed to his eternal glory. Confidence that when you are justified, that you are caught up in God's glory and therefore absolutely assured of sharing it forever. Now, when you look to the future, what do you see? For, for many people, the future is either bleak or non existent or just a big question mark. A believer looks to the future and knows exactly what it holds. And at the end of the game, it holds glory. Nothing can keep you from that future. Why? Because you are justified. We have a sure and certain hope in God's promise. And therefore, we can have joy regardless of our circumstances. Paul continues, verse 2. We have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And you can circle the word grace. Because I imagine that there is someone who's thinking, Jeff, you don't know the pressures I'm facing. You don't know the suffering that I endure. You don't know how bad things are in my life. The people who Paul was writing to, the, the Christians in Rome, they were living under enormous pressures. They were almost certainly poor, but that wasn't the main thing. They were living under the rule of Nero, who was one of the most ruthless, bloodthirsty, evil kings in the history of the world. I, I hear so many American Christians complaining that we are under attack today because of our faith. Well, according to historians at the time that Paul wrote to Rome, this is how Nero treated Christians. He had some sewed up in skins of wild beasts and then worried by dogs until they expired. And others, dressed in stiff shirts made with wax, fixed to axle trees, that basically is a metal cross, and set on fire in his gardens in order to illuminate them. The Christians Paul was writing to, they understood suffering. They had pressures that few of us can imagine. And yet they also had that most precious commodity that is absolutely necessary for people to have joy when dealing with life's pressures and suffering. What did they have? Hope. Do you have any pressure in your life at home or on the job? Really? Of course you do. Of course you do. We all, we all have pressures. 
But I want you to think back to the terrible pressures you used to suffer as a child. You know the things that kids suffer, suffer with. The pressure of having to take a 10-problem math test. The pressure of losing your new toy. The pressure of kids on the playground pointing at you and saying you have cooties. The pressure of having to clean your room before you can go see your friends. If, if you remember, when you were a child, those pressures seemed almost unbearable even though we look back on them today and they seem trivial. We long for the carefree days of youth. I got to tell you, they are not that carefree to the kids. I remember when my kids would be completely stressed out or afraid because of one of those kinds of things. And so often I just have to come up close to them and say something like, it's okay. You know, we can handle this together. It's not all on you. And God says to us, from Isaiah 41, do not fear. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Jesus says to us from Matthew 28, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If you are struggling today, I want you to hold on to this truth that you are not alone. Circumstances may change, but God still loves you. And God is with you to provide strength, to help you to persevere, to give you hope. And if you're not struggling today, let me tell you, you will. (laughs) Sooner or later. But in the meantime, remember that often the way that God is present in the lives of those who are enduring pressures or suffering that seems unbearable is for God to send one of his people to provide encouragement, comfort, hope, and love. And you might be that person whom God is sending to someone else today who needs God's touch. Paul writes in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And, and he's so wrapped up in this that he goes, he says, I'll say it again. <laughs> Rejoice. You know, none of us knows what lies ahead in the new year. A couple things are almost certain. One, some good things are going to happen. And they're going to make you happy. Number two, some bad things are going to happen. And they'll make you sad. And how much happiness you have in this year ahead will have nothing to do with the color of the underwear you wear on New Year's Day. But for those of us who know and trust Jesus, no matter what the circumstances may be, we can have joy. Joy because of what God has done, reconciling us to himself in Jesus Christ. Joy in what God is doing, present with us in the midst of our pressures with power and love. And joy in what God has promised, our sure and certain hope of an eternity being loved by him in glory. So I wish you a joy-filled new year. Lord, thank you for your many promises to us. And we're sorry for the times when we forget those things and we try to to rely on ourselves or our own thinking or our own devices and when we really just need to turn to you. Thank you, Lord, that you have indeed 
justified us by faith. Thank you that you are with us tonight, today, tonight, tomorrow, and for the rest of our lives. We thank you for the hope of glory. In Jesus' name, amen.